Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. This is I, me, your buddy, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and person who loves talking about money. And we talk about money quite a bit on this show and the way it intersects with a lot of things. But often when we talk about money, whether it's intersecting with fashion or healthcare or our professional lives or travel or any of our consumer choices, we will have people in the comments telling us about how these terms like accessible or affordable or any other normative word we're using only really applies to some of us and that people living with disabilities often do not have even remotely the same level of access or affordability to many of the basic day-to-day expenses of life that we're talking about. So many of our decisions exist within a prism and a framework that prioritizes and in many cases necessitates being able-bodied. And although the pandemic did recently teach many of us that health is very much conditional as is ability and that often even when we're making the best choices, it is out of our hands. We still have a ton to learn when it comes to disability, how we relate to it as a culture, and how we effectively punish people for being born in the wrong bodies. All of us could benefit from a healthcare system amongst many systems, which is more accommodating for all of us. But these big policy level changes are almost certainly not going to be made until we start to understand the reality of how all of us are living. I reached out on Twitter to ask you guys who I should talk to specifically about the intersection of disability and money, and you guys overwhelmingly pointed me to my guest today and also sent me tons of great questions for her, which I will be getting into. And thanks to Policy Genius for supporting this episode of the Financial Confessions. Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need. Head to policygenius.com slash TFC to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. Without further ado, I'm joined today by writer, creator, speaker, activist, and advocate Imani Barbarin. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Um, So for those who may not be familiar with your work, could you talk a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is Imani Barbarin. I go by Crutches and Spice online. Um, I started my online presence around 2014 in order to just talk about being disabled and Black and a disabled Black girl. Um, And it's kind of really grown from there, especially during the pandemic, as people started to realize just how much of their life is dictated by ableism and the way our society is set up to really fail disabled people. Um, So that's kind of the work I do. I kind of just shout from the rooftops, everything that people need to know about disability and how you can assist disabled people, as well as um, I really love centering disabled people in all discussions because our voices are rarely, if ever, heard. And when they are, they're kind of tamped down and um, pulled apart and just talked over. So I really love centering disabled voices. You know, I mentioned in the intro that a lot of times when we talk about various subjects on the channel, um, and we speak about them in terms of their accessibility or affordability, we'll have people reminding us like, okay, but maybe only if you're able-bodied and able to access these things or afford these things. Um, When it comes to advocacy for lower income folks, for financial issues, what are some of the ways in which we tend to have a blind spot on the intersection of money and ability? Well, I think the first thing to understand is that in order to have care in the United States, in order to have access to robust health care, especially for um, chronic illnesses and disabilities and diseases that go above and beyond every regular, everyday health insurance, the United States will legislate you into poverty. Um, And so there's a high amount of poor people that have disabilities. Um, Not only that, but racism in itself is disabling. So when we talk about access and financial needs of disabled people, of poor people, you're usually talking about the exact same demographic. Um, And so disabled people have to have usually less than $2,000 to their name if they're on social security income in order to to, um, keep their benefits and keep their healthcare and keep their services. Uh, And it could be very daunting for a lot of disabled people. When you say they have to keep $2,000 to their name, does that mean that if they have more than that, they lose access to those benefits? Yeah, so that's the threshold. That's the most you could have. Uh, Pardon me. That's the most you could have to your name as a disabled person if you're on Social Security income. Um, And different states have different levels, but it's pretty much the average is around $2,000, yes. What is so 
mind blowing about that is that it's not even close to what most people would need in terms of an emergency fund, which is on average three to six months worth of living expenses, just in case of emergency. Oh, no, no. And then on top of that, with a social security income payment, you're only making about $850 a month at most. Like that's the most you can make. Some people make as little as $50, $100, very, very little money. Um, and when you think about the average cost of living per state, that's not nearly enough. No. Well, we talk we talk quite a bit on the channel about persistent economic myths. And one really common one is sort of the welfare queen myth. Thanks, Reagan, um, amongst many other atrocities. Um, but another one that I think a lot of people kind of n sort of keep in the back of their mind as a framing is this perception that a lot of people are in some way gaming the system or profiting off of the system. Can you talk a little bit about that? I hate that idea. It is so ridiculous to me because when you think about gaming the system, people think you're making millions upon millions of dollars, making hundreds of thousands of dollars. A majority of disabled people are not making barely enough to cover food per month. Um, so this idea that you're making a crap ton of money by gaming the system is laughable. And then on top of that, you have to think about all the social implications of being disabled in our society. There is no upside to pretending to be disabled. And quite frankly, I would rather believe somebody who's faking um, I'd actually rather believe a million people that were faking than disbelieve one disabled person that was not. And we have this mindset that gaming the system um, is so prevalent. I mean, we talk about it in every single facet of American culture. Somebody's getting one over on the system. Like, this is not that great to begin with. So nobody's really getting one over. No. And also, I mean, if you manage to like, you know... <laughs> get a little like if you're a low-income person who man who manages to get like a little something extra like good for you that's like all wealthy people and corporations do 24 7. and it's nearly impossible to game the system in order to get a social security income hearing the average wait time is three years and throughout that entire time you're supposed to have less than two thousand dollars to your name and between 2009 and 2019 a hundred thousand people died waiting for social security hearings. So this idea people are gaming the system en masse is absolutely ridiculous. And also, I mean, if you have to live with such a low amount of, you know, wealth on you at any time in order to stay on it, objectively for most people, you're actively punishing yourself financially if you choose to uh, stay on those uh, programs. Yeah, yeah. There really is no disabled middle class. Like there, you either have to be independently wealthy or extremely poor. There's very little people, there are very little disabled people that are making it month to month just on like what they make. It's very difficult. And so to, to just kind of understand the way the system works. So you have, you can't have more than that amount of money, um, sort of, I assume in available in checking or savings. Does that also apply to things like investments, retirement, et cetera? Yeah, basically anything that's not in what's called an ABLE account or in some of these financial tools that are designed for disabled people. Um, and they evaluate every single bank account. If you have more than one car, like things like that, they go through every single asset you have. And what about in terms of income that you're bringing in that maybe you don't keep on your books? Like if you have a source of income and you spend it to the point that you don't have more than that 2000, is that also not okay? It is okay, but you, it's very, very tricky. You know, people can go over by 50 cents and lose their healthcare. Um, so it's very tightly controlled. Um, I've heard of people who were over by like $3 one month and they're, they're, everything was just done, done for, cut off. Um, so it's very sensitive. Do you find in the, um, you know, I'm sure there's a huge, huge spectrum here of, uh, you know, the community of disabled folks. But do you find that in general, people opt, if at all possible, to not use these programs so as not to live under those constraints? You may not have a choice. Right. And like I said, I think the idea we have this really idealistic view of employer uh, related health care. Um, so, so I have cerebral palsy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I have very specialized care. And I know people with Crohn's disease, different things like that. Your insurance may not cover that. The, the right. treatment that you get may not cover that. So it may be financially risky for you to even have a job. Right. Like right. if you're paying more for co-pays and for 
uh, out of network uh, care, it, it's not, it may not financially be feasible for you to have a job. So when I say they legislate you into poverty, you have to go to Medicaid or Medicare that has the more robust healthcare that you need and to stay underneath that income limit regardless. Like it's, it's either your life or your job. Right. Right. No, I, 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 that totally makes sense. I think, you know, what I'm interested, what I'd love to understand is so for people who might be on the margins of being able to have a job, but for whom it would probably be um, better for their quality of life to not work, um, are there instances where people are being pushed into working even when they probably shouldn't because the benefits are not sufficient? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, the pandemic really revealed to us just how many disabled people were working that had never really revealed to their employers that they had a disability um, in order to get that work. So there are a ton of people who are working to make ends meet to just survive um, and who are now, again, having to choose between their health and their job. And when it comes to retirement planning, so that's an entire, you know, a huge subset, a subsection of what we talk about here. And a lot of times when we talk about retirement planning and savings and things like that, we will hear um, people in the comments saying this is very different for um, those of us living with disability. We can't access these same programs. We can't use 401ks, et cetera. What options are there um, for people in these programs to plan for retirement? There's, there's very, very little. The expectation is that you'll be on Medicare or Medicaid for your entire retirement or life. Um, and if you don't pay into Social Security when you're, if you don't have the ability to pay into Social Security because you're unemployed, you don't, you're not going to get a whole ton of Social Security in, in your retirement years, regardless. Um, it's, there's very, very little. There are waiver programs for elderly people uh, that are state run. Basically, you apply and hope that the state will cover your living costs or your, um, your programming or your services. Um, but there's very little, I don't even really, I really try not to think about my retirement because I don't like, I don't even know. And then on top of that, if I, if I'm saving money, my dad, my dad is an accountant. He's obsessed with me saving money for retirement, but the, I don't even know what, how much I'm supposed to save because in addition to just the regular amount, there's also the fact that disabled people pay 28% more to the exact same quality of life. So mm. I would have to be making way, way, way more money and putting it, it away in order to retire and then not even know um, if I could utilize it. And then on top of that, if you're disabled or become disabled um, and need long-term care when you are older, Medicaid can require you to spend on all of your money. You can, you, they will force you to go broke before those services are covered for you. So it's not really much of a choice for disabled people. Another area where we often hear commentary along the lines of, you know, not for everyone, these are not norms, is when we talk about um, consumer choices, especially as they pertain to uh, products that, you know, uh, increase convenience, increase accessibility, increase usability. And often the things that are most accessible to all, you know, bodies are the things that are, you know, in some ways sort of exploitative or looked down on in other ways. For example, you know, people will talk about, oh, there are a lot of certain convenience services and delivery services that you shouldn't be using. And then people will say, well, some people rely on these things to have access. Similarly, you know, banning a lot of things like plastic straws. Well, many people need those in order to consume beverages. And, you know, you look at things like even uh, fast fashion or, you know, pre-prepared foods, all of these things that a lot of, I think, very progressively minded people want us to kind of move away from and in many ways, I think, stigmatize are things that a lot of um, a lot of people rely on from uh, this uh, prism of ability. Can you talk a little bit about that sort of dichotomy within, uh, you know, the progressive world? Yeah. The first thing I have to say is I really can't stand when people say that you don't need this or you don't need that. And they offer no other supports to people. These A lot of the times, non-disabled people will make a list of things that disabled people should not be doing or just the general public should not be doing. And then they offer no alternative and they have no idea what it actually requires to be disabled. Um, there are always tons of things that disabled people come across from you know sliced apples that are, pre that are individually packaged to 
Um, I, th- I saw unpeeled orange. And people were like, why would you even bother? You can peel an orange. If you don't need it, don't buy it. Like, what? <laughs> I, it, like if, if it's not for you, it's not for you. But there are people that are going to need it. Um, and simultaneously, um, they, see, they seem to believe that we all have help at home, that we all have services at home. We do not. A lot of us are just slogging by day by day by ourselves. And unless you you are offering to come to my house and help me with this myself, I'm gonna figure out a way to do it by myself because you are not there. You're not there, you're not here to help me. Um, and all these judgments on what I need to do to survive while you offer no assistance whatsoever are useless to me. Um, so I really kind of ignore them at this point because I'm like, what am I gonna do? You know, I have to have grocery delivery. I can't carry my groceries by myself. Um, you know, I walk with crutches. Like everybody wants me to, to use glass containers. My everything knocks against my crutches. I'll break them. You know, like <laughs> they, there's little things that they don't even think about. Um, yeah. When you talk about like when we talk about like the consumer aspect, for example, I feel like there's a ton of shaming when it comes to consumer choices, and we talk quite a lot on this channel about how. It, lower income people are shamed and judged and picked apart about basically every consumer choice they make and any time like how dare they own an iPhone even though for many people in this country a smartphone is your primary computer how you get and maintain a job how you travel how you you know pay for things etc um that and of course you know higher income folks don't even nearly have those same judgments despite being much more wasteful but it seems like that's uh hugely intensified um if you are disabled because then there's that added perception of like hey we're our tax dollars are paying for this you better you know only spend on certain things um do you feel that there is that heightened level of uh, judgment uh, for what disabled people will spend money on and how? Yeah, there, there's, there, I feel like there's a lot of disdain for disabled people in general. And so there's a microscope underneath over what we do every single day. Um, you know, from, I buy my crutches on Amazon. People don't want me to shop at Amazon. I'm like, I get it, but this is where I buy my crutches. You know, it's, <laughs> our consumer choices are vetted quite seriously and to be quite frank to be quite frank um a lot of disabled people are more sustainable and are more budget conscious and ethically sourcing things than non-disabled people are because we have to like it's a requirement for our health for our safety for our finances we have to do so and so this judgment was really based off of this idea that And I hate to say it, a lot of people just don't believe we should exist. Mm. A lot of people think that anything that we take out into the world and put before us and use to help us is over and extra because we shouldn't be here at all. Um, And we see this in the attitudes that we talk about, the pandemic, our spending habits, every aspect of our lives is put into question and debated all the time. Um, There is a ton of scrutiny for being disabled. but unfortunately, unfortunately for all the people judging, the only thing that separates me from you is luck and time. So right. all these judgments that you are making, all of these um, ideas that you have about that are better, look around, this is your retirement plan. The society that we built that is not accessible, that is not inclusive, this is what you've got. So you fix it now, you build inclusion now, or you'll be at its mercy later. So all these judgments that you're holding about what we do with our money, what we do with our time and resources, they're not useful to you. So figure something else out. That's absolutely right. And I mean, at a certain point, age, ageism and ableism clearly convene for most people. And eventually, you know, I would say it's, I, I don't know if it's a majority, but it's almost certainly a plurality of uh, seniors in our society have to work to some extent in order to fund uh, retirement, which is, you know, absolutely unacceptable in a country this wealthy. But I think part of the reason that we're able to sort of brush that off is because, quite frankly, young people don't imagine it will ever happen to them. And it's like, well, of course it will. You'll become an old person someday unless you don't make it to that age. But otherwise, you're totally right that we're all headed there. Yeah. And I think our we have this fascination as a culture about youth and youth culture and you know making it big when you're young and we and we don't really represent people who are older or disabled um or who have chronic illness or anything like that 
Um, so people don't see themselves in those representations. Therefore, they think it'll never happen to them. And that's intentional to keep people working, to keep people grinding um, in the hopes that they never have to be in that situation. You mentioned grinding. Can you talk a little bit about the proliferation of kind of grind and hustle culture and how you kind of view that as someone uh, in your specific uh, vantage point? Yeah, uh, grind and hustle culture, I can't stand that. I just, I'm not, I'm not doing it anymore. And I, I was very much of the mindset when I left college, oh, I'm going to hit the ground running and move to New York and do all these things. Um, and it, like, it didn't pan out that way. And I, I still think of myself as good at what I do. Um, but a grind and hustle culture is inherently ableist. And most, for the most part, it is ableist to yourself. Um, because you are overextending yourself, exhausting yourself, harming yourself, and a lot of times hurting yourself um, in the hopes that you survive. And to a certain extent, um, that's what the system requires of you, is to keep going until your body breaks down. But it doesn't have to come to that. Like rest is just as important as anything else to your survival. So rest, lay down, take a seat, read a book, do something. Um, but grind and hustle culture that tells you that you need to go on and on and on until you are broken. Um, and then once you stop grinding, then what's left? You get to enjoy what you got. Do you get to sit down and rest in the fruits of your labor? Not always. And very rarely do you get to do that. I feel like grind and hustle culture were kind of simultaneously, simultaneously kind of rose with wellness culture in a lot of ways where I feel like it used to be more socially acceptable, especially for women to speak overtly in terms of weight. I feel like that's slightly less socially acceptable, although obviously it's still hugely a paradigm in our society. But I feel like we've gotten to this place where we can sort of talk about health and wellness as a paradigm, um, which I also find very strange because in many cases, those are things that are totally out of people's control. Um, I'd love to hear you talk about health and wellness culture. So to talk about health and wellness culture, we have to understand our entire outlook on health in this country. And that is framed through what I like to call, well, not I didn't come up with it, but the individual model of disability as well as the medical model of disability, which states that disability is a medical issue, illness is a medical issue, and it also is an individual problem. It's for you to fix, not for society, not for the government, not for anybody else. You fix your disability, you fix yourself, um, and then you can enter into society through that. Um, and that's, that is wellness and uh, wellness culture to its heads. If I take care of myself, then I shouldn't have to worry about all these other things. It doesn't work like that, you know? <laughs> um, health is out of your control nine times out of 10. Not only that, but your health is a group project. Mm -hmm. um, and you need other people to help you remain as best as you can. It, it is um, as relaxed and is at peace in your own body as you can. You need other people to do that. Um, and we're told that it is an individual issue so that we don't look at the system as a whole. We don't look at the things that are out of our control, our for-profit healthcare system. Um, the fact that we, um, that we legislate people into poverty, that we, uh, we have food deserts and um, like income inequality and, and environmental racism, all these things. People fail to look at those things, but they say, oh, did you have your kale shake today? Did mm. you? Did you really? Did you walk around today? Did, uh, did you really do it? And you're like, it's smoggy outside. What the hell are you talking about? Like, my health is not just, it's not just me. It's not just on me. Um, and it bleeds into every other aspect of our society. You know, we have people saying, you know, I don't want to take care of your health. I don't want you leeching off my money with universal health care. Look at <laughs> like look at what we're dealing with it's not all on the individual we have to come together at some point and say that it is unacceptable unacceptable for me to watch other people suffer and then blame it on them and then never question the system as a whole you know it's it's interesting to talk about the healthcare system because we have gone over this so many times on the channel so i'm sure you know those listening or familiar with these stats, but just to reiterate, like 
We spend more per capita than almost any other developed nation. We have worse health outcomes, lower life expectancy. You know, it's the leading cause of bankruptcy, uh, medical uh, um, bills and, and all of this stuff. Like clearly the system is not working, even for, you know, the able bodied among us, even for people who are young and doing everything right from a health perspective. Like our healthcare system is still failing us in every way. And yet when we look at the choices people make politically, it seems like people are very much stuck in a cycle of wanting to keep uh, this hyper individualist for profit healthcare system. Why do you personally think that is? Racism. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think a lot of it is racism. Um, a a non governmental tribunal, I think, like in last year, like the end of last year, came to the conclusion that the US has continued genocide utilizing our healthcare system, um, basically forcibly disabling people utilizing our healthcare, medical racism, and then leaving them to die. Um, the, high, the groups with the highest rates of disability are indigenous folks and black folks. Um, and we are, those are the two groups that we blame the most for health com, healthcare outcomes. Uh, it's intentional. People, people will you know, cut off their nose to spite their face. My mom always says that when it comes to racism and the way these systems are built. Um, and if people, it, Racism makes the power structure that be a lot of money, but it is costing the individual everything. And so if your life matters less than your racism, then you deserve the health care system that we have. But yeah. if we actually decided to build a society that actually lived up to its, its goals and decided that we're not going to throw people to the wolves because they have a different skin tone or they have a different gender or they have a different sexuality if we decided that we're actually going to care about each other and not the people in power then we could actually build a system that is inclusive of, of all of us and our health care will be the very first thing that changes we have to change it and i find it a, a monumental failing that during this pandemic um there's been like these, these, these weak little whimperings of maybe we need universal health care. Why are we not fighting for it harder? Why? This is the greatest health care crisis in the world. And we are looking at it like, well, we're going to return to normal. Normal never worked. Our health care system did not work. It does not work. So what are we going to do about it? It was really... I, I think few things made me feel more cynical than looking at the subreddits um, during the height of uh, the past couple waves of COVID um, for people who were super staunchly, super staunchly anti-vax, super staunchly anti-public health measures, um, who were making fun of other people for taking COVID seriously um, and all of that kind of stuff, and then got COVID and either died or ended up, uh, you know, in a medically induced coma for multiple months or whatever their outcome was. But, you know, and there were, I mean, there's a subreddit with, you know, probably a million users at this point where there's hundreds of new posts a day of this still happening. Um, where you see people who literally from essentially their deathbed are posting these um, memes making fun of, you know, people who take COVID seriously, essentially. Um, and I, it really, for me, created this feeling of like, if that is not enough for people um, to rethink how they imagine community health and to whom they want to extend health to, including themselves, I mean, what will change people? Yeah, and I think it's really disheartening to know that our society is designed to eradicate all forms of community. We don't mm -hmm. have communities. We, I mean, there are certain cultures that have communities within the United States, but we as a whole do not have community. We do not support one another. We do not help one another out. And we actually laugh at the people that do. Mm -hmm. Like we ostracize people, we isolate people who dare to care about other people. And that's the first thing that needs to change about us as a society. I want to take a quick pause and once again thank today's episode sponsor, Policy Genius. Something we talk about often here at TFD is the importance of insurance. If someone relies on you for financial support, whether that's a child, an aging parent, or even a business partner like me, you need life insurance. 
Life insurance can give you a peace of mind that if something happens to you, those that rely on you would have a financial cushion for rent or mortgage payments, loans, education costs, and everyday expenses. And Policy Genius is your one-stop shop to find and buy the insurance you need. So click the link in the description or head to policygenius.com slash TFC and answer a few questions. In minutes, you can compare personalized quotes from top companies to find your lowest price. And you could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. The team of licensed experts at Policy Genius will help you understand your options and apply for the policy you choose. The Policy Genius team works for you, not the insurance companies. You can trust them to offer unbiased help and advocate for you at every step until you're covered. And just one more reason why we love Policy Genius, because you know we're always about a deal, they don't add on extra fees. So head to policygenius.com slash TFC to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. Do you think COVID as a whole expanded or reduced the level of cultural empathy we have for disability? Uh, depends on who you are. <laughs> um, I think, I think, well, what I'll say is this, when I, when I started, when the pandemic started, I had about like maybe 40,000 followers on Twitter. Um, I, I didn't, I hadn't even started my TikTok and I had like maybe 10,000 on Instagram. And as the pan, almost like clockwork, as the pandemic started, as non-disabled people started realizing just how ableist our system was, all of my profiles just skyrocketed mm-hmm. to a point where like it was unmanageable because I was like, I was like, I didn't, exp- I didn't expect that trajectory to happen, but it did. And it was absurd to me because I'm like, I, we've been saying this for years. All of this stuff is not new. Uh, all everything that we're talking about in terms of the system leaving you in the dust about you having to spend on your money if you want healthcare about about you know not being able to get married if you're disabled because you'll have too much money in the bank if you combine assets like all of these things we've been telling people and now that it affected them they're like oh now we're ready to listen at the same time it's like a firestorm for disabled people because we're reading over medical rationing guidelines that are telling us that if we get sick we'll be the last to get care, if any, or, you know, stock up on these things because you're not going to be outside for a while. There, you know, nobody's really going to get to care for you if you're in the hospital. Um, so I think people started to care because it affected them. But I do think that there is such a lack of um, empathy to begin with. I mean, our society created eugenics. Like the, the eugenics that started here inspired the Nazis, not the other way around. Um, and so it is a through line through all of our history and it re- really reared its ugly head during the pandemic. I don't think it ever went away. I don't think that it increased. I think it just revealed itself to a lot of people who were not at its mercy. You mentioned healthcare and kind of interacting with the system. Can you just kind of walk us through a little bit the experience of interacting with the healthcare system if you uh, do have a disability? Yeah, uh, you mean in terms of the pandemic or just in general? Um, in general, but, you know, definitely if there are specific differences in the pandemic, I would love to hear them. Um, interacting with healthcare, especially if you have a pre-existing condition that's not like of the norm, I guess. Um, it's, it's a lot of phone calls to get uh, prior approval or haggling with your insurance from month to month to get your medication covered. Um, it's a lot of out of pocket spending if you're on an employer based healthcare system, uh, health plan. Um, it's transportation is a nightmare. Um, I mean, like every single aspect of a disabled person's life is dictated by our healthcare. You know, it's hard for some disabled people to even get to the hospital or get to uh, a doctor's office to coordinate transportation. Paratransit is horrible. Um, we are also in the midst of a direct support worker crisis. Like there's not enough direct support workers to go around. Um, so people are going without aids and assistance. Uh, there's also the fact that it's, you know, you're, a lot of people struggle to even get a diagnosis, especially if you're a woman or a person of color um, or a queer, it's very difficult to get diagnosed. And then if you do, it could be held against you um, in a lot of different cases. Uh, and I think what a lot of people don't realize about healthcare is that it impacts everything. I mean, there, there's some, there are certain cases in which if, if the doctor writes down the wrong thing on your chart, you could lose the right to vote. 
Uh, so like if somebody decides that you that you need to be in a conservatorship or a guardianship because of what a doctor recommended, you could lose your right to vote in certain states. Mm. Um, it's it's it impacts literally every aspect to your life. Uh, and during COVID, what wound up happening is that disabled people lost everything. Like almost immediately, services just stopped. Um, day programs stopped. Uh, direct support workers like could no longer interact with a lot of their clientele. So a lot of people lo- lost their direct support. Um, a lot of special education programs just stopped immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then all this with the underscoring of, hey, we've made accessible, we made society more accessible for non-disabled people. Um, so, which was just like a punch to the gut. Uh, so it it was. COVID really changed a lot of things and, and things are starting to go back, but I, th- I don't think we're ever going to get back to a place where we were before. And to be quite honest, we shouldn't have um, even been in that place. Like a third of people who died of COVID did so in nursing homes and congregate care settings. So it's, it's, it's been rough. What is your current comfort level with activities and things like that vis-a-vis the pandemic? So I've been, I've been going out, um, I traveled, um, but I just keep my mask on and I even still get minor panic attacks with the idea of like leaving like my cocoon little space. Um, and more so now I have to be traveling more for, um, work, uh, as it were, (laughs) uh, going to conventions and different things like that. But I, I'm, I'm staying masked. I don't care what anybody says. They can look at me sideways. I was just on a plane back from, um, vacation the other day and these men were complaining that they had to put on masks in Philadelphia because there's like a city ordinance and then I get off the plane in Philly and like less than half of the people are wearing a mask regardless like nobody's enforcing it despite this city ordinance so it's it's awful (laughs) and I worry about my friends especially those who cannot get vaccinated because I think that that gets lost in the conversation, we talk a lot about anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers, but we don't talk about quite often the people that just cannot get vaccinated. You know, I have a friend with severe allergic reactions who was recommended to not get the vaccine. Um, Do they, do they not have to, are they not able to exist in society anymore? Are we not allowed to anymore? Um, Is this a resurgence of the ugly laws? So, oh, sorry, the ugly laws were lost from the 1860s to 1974 stating that disabled people couldn't be in public because we disturbed non-disabled people by looking at us, so. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, do you, how does it feel when people talk about, you know, the, the deaths being mostly elderly and disabled folks? Like, well, that's a good thing. That's a positive sign. Like, it seems, even from my vantage point, like, I can't imagine hearing that. I mean, I've heard it so often. I think I oscillate between absolute rage and like, I, I, I've heard it so often. I'm just like, I, I, I don't know what to feel about it anymore because I'm exhausted of hearing it. Um, and it really hurts that so, that so many people think that way, but it enrages me because there's all these false promises for disabled people about inclusion and about representation. And then the minute people are inconvenienced, and to be clear, inconvenienced by having to wear a mask or having to have these ordinances and um, all these things, then we're disposable, really? So I just feel like a lot of people are liars and lying to disabled people about how they actually feel about them. Well, yeah, a lot of people are liars. That's true. Um, you mentioned representation. I feel like, I mean, listen, Hollywood is always patting itself on the back prematurely, but there's been a lot of conversations about like, oh, there's so much more representation in all kinds of television and media and film and whatever. How do you feel about that specifically as it pertains to disability? Um, disability, disability representation has been, it's been increasing in some ways. Um, I, I would love it for, for it to be more diverse disabled people. Right. Um, I feel like we, I feel like I, I do have a vendetta of, against the the journey of the disabled white man to get laid. Um, I'm sick of that storyline. Can we pick a different one for the love of God? Um, 
you know, anyways, um, but, but, you know, I think with representation it is getting a little bit better, but I wish there were more diverse and cultural narratives around disability because disability is very different from race to race, from culture to culture, from gender. Like, and we don't talk about the nuances to disability enough, um, but I do see opportunity on the horizon um, and hopefully I'll be there to help create those opportunities in some way. Indeed. Um, So as I mentioned, you guys asked um, a truly amazing number of questions. So I'm going to dedicate the rest of my time with Amani to ask some of them. Okay. Um, So a lot of people asked about the, um, uh, just like the savings aspect and like what you have to give up, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, Is it still the case that disabled people are required to give up benefits to save money? It sounds like yes, because you can't have more than the 2000, right? Yes, there are certain tools though. Certain, um, I think most states have what what are called ABLE accounts. Okay. Um, And each state has like their own regulations on them. They can be very restrictive on what you can spend them on. But I think the annual contribution that you can make to those is about $15,000 a year. Um, so you can save a little bit of money, but again, look into those regulations um, as to what you're allowed to spend them on, because that can be a little bit more restrictive than people are used to. A lot of people are asking about how you can generally sort of um, be competitive or even feel like you can pursue professional goals um, while, you know, especially under this sort of stricture of hustle culture and everyone should be working as hard as they can. Yeah. Um, in terms of in terms of pursuing professional goals, I think the hardest part in terms of getting a profession and pursuing things is non-disabled people's bias towards hiring you. Um, a lot of disabled people miss a crap ton of opportunities because people just either do not want to provide accommodations or do not think we're capable of the work. Um, and to be quite honest, a lot of disabled people are overqualified for the jobs that they're applying to. To be quite frank, like, with the exact same level of experience and um, and uh, and knowledge as some CEOs, but are on, are applying to entry level jobs because that's what they think the company will give them. Um, so that's the, usually the hardest part in pursuing professional goals. Um, but the savings aspect of it can be very daunting as well as well as the money management. Um, I recommend you know. I, I just quit my job like a week and a half ago to work for myself. Um, and I recommend taking on as many projects as you are comfortable with and really kind of creating a resume that is outside of these corporations or even organizations so that you can show off what you're passionate about and show off what you like to work on. And then hopefully that will lead to more opportunities in the future. Um, speaking of professional stuff, what do you think this person is asking? What do you think about disclosing a chronic yet mostly invisible illness while interviewing for a job? So that really has to do with your comfort level doing so. Um, a lot, so what they're asking is that during the application pro- process, the EEOC will ask you, um, do, do you have a disability? Yes or no, like race, gender, disability status. Um, and I've, <laughs> I have disclosed that I'm disabled, disabled on hundreds of job applications and never got a single interview. And when I stopped disclosing, I got like six in a week. Um, What I recommend is that if you don't feel comfortable disclosing, if you don't need accommodations either, that's an important nuance. If you don't need accommodations either, then you don't have to disclose. Like feel free to not tell anybody who doesn't need to know. However, if you do need to disclose, if you do need accommodations, wait until you have an offer in writing in some way. Mm. And then, from then on, once you start requesting accommodations, make sure everything is in writing. Right. I cannot stress that to you enough. Right. Because you essentially, like, if there is going to be some sort of, like, discrimination action, you have to be able to prove everything, and they're going to do their damnedest to disprove you. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I said exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this person says, as a fellow disabled, as a fellow working disabled Black woman, has the strong Black woman trope come to haunt her? And, and moreover, which stereotypical trope is she subjected to more between helpless and disabled or a strong black woman? That's so rude. <laughs> no, um, it's so not you. <laughs> they like to put me on blast and I love my, I love my people. Um, but um, 
Yes, I do. I do feel very much so at the mercy of the stereotype, mostly the strong black woman. Um, Cause I, I consider myself passionate and very dedicated to what I do. So people think like they could pile on different things for me to also do. Um, I keep getting asked to run for president or run for office and I don't want to, um, like, <laughs> you know, so exposure I already have. You had a death threats I've already gotten. Like, I don't want to do that. Um, and I don't, it's hard and it's hard for me to not take that on, to like actually take rest and to, to let myself like say no and stop doing things. Um, I struggle with that all the time because I grew up, you know, on the bench, you know, watching everybody else do fun things. And so like whenever people ask me to do things, I'm like I could do it. I could definitely do it. Um, nobody really thinks of me as helpless because I have an attitude problem. Um, <laughs> so, so, so yeah, but it's more the strong black woman thing. Um, okay. Uh, this person is asking a, an interesting question. Would broadening the public definition slash understanding of disability ultimately help or hurt disabled people in the workplace? For example, diabetes is a disability, but the general population often doesn't interpret it as such. If employers paid more to cover insulin, a dream, do you think we'd have more people rallying against special treatment or more people getting on board because a lot of people use insulin? So I think what would happen in that scenario, if we broaden the, if we broaden the definition of disability, what we'll come up against is people refusing to identify as disabled mm -hmm. um, for fear of being seen as other or being seen as worthless or less valuable. Um, and so they, out of that fear, will, will rail against this more broadening of a definition because we are, we, I talk about this all the time. I tell people like diabetes is a disability, needing glasses is a disability, having asthma is a disability, all these things are disabilities. Um, but people don't consider themselves that because in a lot of cases, those are accommodated for. Um, but I think it would, I think it would serve us in like a perfect world for more people to understand how disability and whether or not you consider yourself disabled or even have a disability dictates how you move about the world. Because I think that that's something that we discount is that ableism affects every single one of us. Um, and we don't talk about it enough. <laughs> One thing that I really wasn't even aware of until I became an employer and started having employees take maternity leave, which thank goodness we're in New York state where it's like pretty substantially subsidized compared to most states is like a lot of the maternity leave uh, subsidies from the state are um, either directly or indirectly linked with uh, disability coverage um, because, you know, pregnant women and new mothers are considered like to themselves have a kind of disability um, in the workplace. And I think we'd probably be a lot better off and women, uh, you know, and people having kids would be a lot better off if they understood that framing from the get-go, because I think an unintentional result of not really classifying it as such is that people go into, you know, pregnancy and childbirth and, and postnatal life comparing themselves to a version of themselves before rather than comparing themselves to this new framework. Yeah, and there is a list of horrors on TikTok Oh, of childbirth it is definitely a short-term disability like i i i'm terrified like I, I, anyways um but yeah like it, it's really helpful to frame it that way yeah absolutely because people i don't know i think that entire like wanting to to seen to see more to be seen as strong it hurts ourselves more than it hurts anyone else um Okay, uh, I'll ask two more quick ones from the audience and then we'll wrap up with our fun little rapid fires because why not? Um, okay, so what are some accommodations that can make life for disabled people not only easier but cheaper too? Uh, that's a hard one because each person has like their own thing, like their own access, access needs. Um, I, it's really hard to say, to be honest. Mm. Like, I wouldn't know where to start. Um, I, I, I think I think we need more public funding for accessible infrastructure. That's what I'll say, because I think that putting the onus on the individual to make their lives more accessible is so difficult to determine. But mm. if we make society more accessible, it would be far easier. We need walkable cities. We need public transportation. We need paratransit. Um, but I can't think of one thing like one thing that would that an individual could buy 
Because like, that's, that's rough. That's a rough one. <laughs> well, we also are getting a few questions and I would really love to know this as well. What are ways that you find joy and community and hope? Um, I, I love collaborating with disabled people. I love it so much. I really do love my community. I really, like, I, I truly do. I think that they, the disability community, at least a little section I'm a part of, because let's remember disabled people are still people, the same dynamic still exists. Um, but the little corner that I've carved out is this amazing people. And I love talking with them and just commiserating and just having fun. Um, I love reading, I love writing. Um, and I just, I really love creating. That's my favorite thing. Yes. And sorry, there is one last one that I do want to ask about because I do think this is really interesting. Um, any advice for navigating a relationship with an able-bodied person, especially as it pertains to money? Yes. Yeah, so always consider your safety first. Um, that disabled people are more likely to be victims of domestic violence than um, uh, financial abuse. So take your, sa- take your safety first. Um, but also discuss expectations as the relationship progresses. A lot of disabled people cannot get married um, because of income limits, um, because of healthcare, because of monitoring, all these different things. So understand those expectations and let them know what your financial situation is and what your financial situation may allow the relationship progress to pr- progress into. Um, and always keep that clear and open communication with them about that. I love it. So the time has come. Um, Imani, these are our rapid fire questions. Um, they're just fun little questions about money. Feel free to pass or, you know, whatever you want. Um, just whatever comes top of mind rapid fire. So the first question is, what is the big financial secret of your industry? Everybody's struggling. <laughs> Everybody's struggling. That is the truth for so many industries. Um, what do you invest in versus what are you cheap about? Um, I invest in experiences. A lot of times I am cheap about clothes. I will not shop for something if it's not on sale. I don't care. Love that. Um, What has been your best investment and why? My best investment has been, um, I have a scooter and I use it for like um, events where I have to run around or I'm not running anywhere. So I'm using the scooter <laughs> and it's really great for me to get around in events where I have to be speaking and have to be one block in one minute, minute and then another block, another minute. Amazing. Um, what has been your biggest money mistake and why? I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's six and one and a half a dozen the other probably student loans. Like I owe like $80,000 in student loans. So Listen, Biden, we're hearing rumors. He might actually be canceling some student loans. So let's hope he comes through. Be. <laughs> um, what is your biggest current money insecurity? Um, renovating my home to be accessible. Um, I worry about that. That's on my radar. What has been the financial habit that has helped you the most? Um, taking care of things immediately, as if I can. Um, yeah. And last question is, when did you first feel successful? And what does that word mean to you? Um, I first felt like really successful like a couple weeks ago. And this little kid, like for their classroom drawing of somebody that they admired drew me. And I was in tears for like a day and a half. And like, I was like, because the little kid was on crutches too. Oh my gosh. Um, but like when, when other disabled black kids see themselves in me, I feel really successful. What a touching answer. All right. Well, thank you so, so much for joining and sharing all of um, your wisdom and humor on these issues. I so loved it. Where can our audience go to find more of what you do? Um, I am on crutchesandspice.com. I'm also at crutches underscore and underscore spice on TikTok, Instagram, and I'm at a money underscore barber on Twitter. I am also Sorry. I am also on collectivespeakers.com. You can hire me to speak at your company, university, or events. Love it. And thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, We will see you on a brand new episode of the Financial Confection. The Financial Confections? (laughs) Or Candy Shop. (laughs) We will see you next week, next Monday to be exact, on an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.